Hey guys and welcome to Aussie Reviews and welcome to this month's Q&A. Now guys, we've got a heap of questions to get through and believe it or not, I still get a lot of people who message me privately asking for my help. And I, look, I get it, I can understand it, but as I've posted about a handful of times now, unfortunately guys, I just don't have the time to get back to everyone individually for free. I just can't, I have to limit my time to you guys. So please, if you can afford to uh, donate something on Patreon or via PayPal, then I can help you out in return. I can put aside that time that's needed to give you the answers that you need. So let's jump into this month's uh, Q&A. All right, so the first question we got is from Ian, and he says, uh, Hi Aussie, uh, what precautions do you take when harvesting game meat in terms of safe food handling? My wife is a chef and she's very strict on how we prepare food in the kitchen to avoid food poisoning. I've heard all bacteria gets killed off while cooking. Um, would it matter if you break um, the bowels when gutting a rabbit, for example? Okay, well, mate, uh, look, I agree. I, um, you know, I try to handle it as safe as possible. And yes, you know, a lot of bacteria will die if you cook meat thoroughly. Um, you know, if it isn't cooked thoroughly, then obviously you can have issues there. But for rabbits, um, you know, because that's what you've used here as your example, you know, like I'll, I'll shoot a rabbit, for example, I'll gut it straight away, and then uh, I, I'll just throw it in the back of the ute, like in a esky or a box or something like that. So if I'm going out, I'm getting a handful of rabbits, so I might go out, um, you know, get say five or six of them, then I bring them all back, and then that's when I'll skin them, okay? So um, if, for example, I was to, uh, you know, pierce the bowel, you know, and you've got feces going everywhere. Like, yeah, I honestly, personally, I, I wouldn't touch the meat then. That's just me. And I know others may, but, um, you know, you've asked me for my honest opinion on it, mate, and that's what I would do. I, I wouldn't touch that meat. So when I take the meat back um, and obviously skin and then, uh, you know, bone it out, usually that time period is no more than about an hour. Um, you know, because most of your shooting, especially with rabbits, I find is of a night time. So it is a little bit cooler. If during the day, you know, you're out shooting and obviously you had sun blaring down on the back of the uh, ute, well, you've got your, your rabbits. I'd honestly have them in an esky and just keep them cool. That's just my personal take on it. Next question I got here is from Ben and he says, uh, G'day Aussie. Uh, my CZ-22 rifle has shot approximately two and a half thousand rounds. What's your thoughts on cleaning and greasing the bolt and also servicing the trigger mechanism? Both are functioning fine at the moment. Well, what you'll find is you'll get a lot of use out of a 22 before you really need to uh, worry about replacing anything in the trigger, such as a trigger spring or something like that. Um, you know, mate, I've, I've shot thousands and thousands of rounds through uh, my uh, original uh, 1710 DKL and shoots and it's been fine as well. Now rim fires are dirty so there's two things that uh, you know I would do after you fire a couple of thousand rounds. Disassemble the bolt. Um, your manual should show you how to do that. Um, so what you do is just take it apart there, clean it all up as I've uh, done in my beginner series with how to clean and maintain a rifle, you know, I love using G96. It's never failed me. So get yourself some of that. And I would just put a uh, thin layer of that all over the bolt and internally as well, just to lubricate everything up nicely. Uh, as for the trigger itself, look, you don't need to actually disassemble the trigger uh, or trigger mechanism there. Um, what I've found is just with a bolt action firearm, obviously just take it out of the stock and um, you can just wipe down any grit and um, dirt that's on the outside of that trigger housing and mechanism. Like I say, you really don't have to disassemble the trigger altogether. And once again, put a fine uh, spray or layer of G96 over it and it'll just keep going and going. Next question I got here is from Shane. He says, uh, hi Aussie, how are you going mate? Um, I have a uh, 22LR and just put a, a Vortex Diamondback 4 to 12 by 40 on it with the hash marks. Would you side in with uh, subsonics or standard uh, ammo for shooting mainly rabbits? Well, I had actually sighted in for uh, high velocity, mate, to be honest. Um, I always do with my 22s. So usually what I'll do is I'll sight it in at 50 yards. And, you know, I really like those loophole uh, VX uh, Freedom Rimfire scopes. They're the same, you know, they've got like those hash marks on the lower part of the uh, reticle. So what I find is if I sight in high velocity ammo, 
uh, for 50 yards. Usually it's uh, four of those hash marks down or in other words, four MOA drop at 100. Um, I find it's pretty much right on. So what I would suggest is, you know, if you want to use subsonics or even standards or, you know, you want to go up to high velocity, by all means, just sight it in there at 50 and then experiment with it. So in other words, shoot the rifle then at 100 and just work out the corresponding hash mark um, with the point of impact at 100. So in other words, you know, if you get, um, you know, it, it might be like say three hash marks down or four or five, um, you know, using subsonic ammo. So then you know where that bullet drop is going to uh, impact at 100. So that's the way I'd do it. Next question I got here is from Graham and he says, uh, hey Aussie, what's your experience with uh, fox whistles? Uh, do you have a favorite type of whistle and how frequently uh, do you use the whistle in the field to gain maximum attention of a fox? Uh, cheers Aussie, keep up the good work, Graham. Thanks mate. Uh, well, it may surprise a lot of people, but uh, the majority of my uh, fox shooting hasn't been so much with specifically going out there and calling them. Uh, I do have one fox whistle, and it's the one from STS Targets. It's $15 including postage, but yeah, it works a treat. So I've never worried about like uh, actual electronic callers with foxes. To be honest with you though, most of the time I'm driving around, I'm trying to shoot uh, rabbits or hares, or you know, going after some wild dogs and then you'll see a fox pop up in the field. And then usually all I do is you just mimic um, a rabbit or a hare in distress. Just like that. Um, and then they'll stop, they'll look, um, especially if they're a younger fox and they don't have too much experience, you'll see them, you know, they'll come towards you. They'll come running towards you and then you've just got to uh, be able to take that accurate, humane shot and that's it. So. That's all I do, mate. Um, but yeah, if you want to go and specifically target foxes, um, you know, <laughs> your lips will get pretty sore if you try that method that I just showed you. So honestly, get yourself a uh, fox whistle. I suggest just go and get one from STS Targets. You can't get any cheaper than that, really. Next question I got here is from Daniel, and he says, uh, G'day, Aussie. Hope you and yours are all well. My question is a bit like Anne's. What's your understanding and or experience with eating feral pigs? I've spoken to hunters, vets, and doctors all about the health risks. I know that the main diseases are hydated tapeworm and uh, brucellosis, uh, but there are other diseases. Even so, I have met many hunters that still eat feral pigs. After checking the bodies and organs and cooking them well, I also know plenty that don't. Cheers. Well, okay, so let's start at the top here. Um, let's talk about the tapeworm. Um, you can't actually get uh, the tapeworm, uh, you know, yourself as a human from eating, you know, uh, cattle or something like that that has that tapeworm in them. The most uh, uh, contagious animal, believe it or not, is a wild dog. Um, wild dogs, you know, can have thousands of these eggs on them and, and um, you know, you can get that from them and handling them and also, you know, made as easy as having like wild dog feces around like crops and you eat some of those crops, you can actually get it that way. So, um, you know, it's funny though, even if you uh, like burst a cyst because, you know, like you'll have like on um, the lungs, for example, of like a beast, you know, they can have these cysts with the, the, the uh, tapeworm cause. So even if you burst some of those cysts and it goes over the meat there, um, if you then obviously cook it, you're not going to have any issues there from transmission to a human. So yeah, the main uh, cause of that is wild dogs. So I wouldn't be too concerned like with uh, pigs with the tapeworm there, um, you know, provided obviously you cook the meat thoroughly. Uh, now, on the um, other side of it, the... Um, uh, brucellosis. Now, obviously, uh, you can contract that, you know, from pigs. So there's a couple of things that I look out for personally. One of the biggest things, and this goes for right across the board, no matter what actual animal I'm eating, is have a look at the eyes. You know, is there like mucus around the eyes? Is there something wrong with the animal? Is there fur, um, you know, like matted and falling out? You know, in other words, are they picked up a poison? Like I said, this is just general sort of uh, guidelines that I use. But uh, when we're talking more about uh, brucellosis, 
Um, you know, is the animal weak? Like, is their back legs lame? Are they dragging them almost? Um, you know, are they not running as normal as what the other pigs are, for example? Or when you shoot them, if it's a, uh, you know, if uh, you're looking at a female or a male, so the male will actually have really swollen testicles um, and the female uh, can have discharge coming from the vagina. So, you know, there are telltale signs with that in pigs. So once again, you know, if it's got any of that, I won't touch it. But obviously, if it's everything looks fine, everything's good, and no signs of anything there, I just make sure that I, um, you know, obviously cook the meat very thoroughly. As for precautions, mate, I also too like if it if it's anything like that, um, you know, from a pig. Obviously, if you've got cuts on your arms and you get the blood in those cuts and, and so forth, you can actually get it transmitted to you. So you wanna make sure you've got no sort of abrasions or cuts on you. And uh, obviously, you know, be very clean about your practice. So in other words, like, you know, until you know what's um, going on with that pig, like don't let your dogs near it, for example, because it can transmit to them. Um, just general common sense safety precautions that I use. So um, yeah, I think pretty much we've covered everything there, mate. So I hope that answers your question. Now, the next question I got here is from Aaron. He says, uh, G'day, Aussie. Do you have any plans for another get-together day? It was great to uh, talk to like-minded people and meet people like yourself. Well, mate, I know. I've, I've got to get another one done. Um, I do have a hell of a lot on my plate right now. But, uh, yes, I would like to organise another one. Um, I'm pretty sure there'd be a lot of interest in it because I have been asked a bit about it. And uh, as you would know, um, you know, we were limited to 100 tickets on that day and they just sold out virtually instantly. So, um, yeah, I have to put a bit of thought into it, see if we can have another get-together day where, you know, we can maybe uh, obviously accommodate more people or whatever. But I'll just see, mate. I'll put some thought into it. But, uh, yeah, as for anything this year, I can't see me doing anything this year, perhaps next year. Now the next question is from Matt and he says, G'day Aussie, my question is about transporting firearms in vehicles as I'm in Victoria and travel from my house to a private property for target shooting and hunting as well as other states but have recently been told that locking your firearms in a vehicle cabin and out of sight is not legal for transport and overnight storage at remote hunting properties. I've been uh, told a non-removable locked toolbox etc is the only way. I travel with a compact uh, 308, an Adler B220, and a Gen 3 Ruger Precision 338 Lapua, which I'm not sure about taking too far, as it has a folding stock that I'm unsure of in the different states due to their laws. Keep up the good work, Matt. Okay, so the Ruger Precision, mate, um, let's address that first. Anything with a folding stock or adjustable stock is pretty much prohibited in New South Wales and Canberra, as I understand it. So, you know, even though <clears throat> it's legal in Victoria and it will be legal here in Queensland, you can't travel through New South Wales with it, okay? Because if you get pulled up, um, you know, you get treated as <laughs> where you are at that time. And if it's illegal in New South Wales and you've got possession of it, well, you know, you'd be committing an offence there. So, um, yeah. I like to always use a comparison. Look, think of it as like the USA. Look at all the stuff there that is completely legal there. But if they come to Australia, can they have it? Well, no, they can't. So, um, you know, it, you get treated as the laws are wherever you are in the world. So whatever country or state that you're in, you need to abide by those laws. It doesn't matter whether it's legal back home, so to speak, you know. So, yeah, I'd be very uh, cautious with doing that because New South Wales has some very crazy laws, in my view, with regards to uh, uh, firearms. So, uh, yeah, be very careful on that one. Now, there was something else I was going to mention too. Yeah, so with... Uh, with firearms, also with pistol grips in some states, they're a problem. So you've got to really know what you're looking at. Um, you know, and the best way to do it is obviously contact the uh, firearms branch or weapons licensing and get something in writing saying that, yeah, that is legal to bring into the state. Or obviously have a look at the legislation yourself because a lot of the time it will clearly be there. Now, uh, speaking of legislation, uh, you're sort of on the right track and also wrong as it applies to Queensland for safe storage when you're away from home. So section 95 of the weapons regulation up here talks about that safe storage when you're not basically at home where your secure storage is. So um, 
what it says there is basically a firearm needs to be uh, stored unloaded uh, when it's not in your possession you're away from your secure storage facilities in a securely closed container so that means not locked but securely closed so that can be obviously a gun bag that's um, you know completely uh, closed like you know for example you got the plastic um, ones that open up you know you can close them and and even though they're not locked they got the tabs there to hold it closed for example well that would comply um, so in a one of those uh, securely closed containers with the bolt removed or with the trigger lock fitted okay or it says in a locked container now either of those containers whether it's a locked container or a uh, securely closed container um, needs to be out of sight um, in a locked room of a permanent building. So if you were traveling here to Queensland and you were on a remote hunting property that didn't have any infrastructure on it, so it didn't have any buildings, well, what are you gonna do? Well, there's another option there for actually um, having the container in a locked boot of your vehicle, or if you don't have a boot, then you can actually have it um, you know, out of sight in the vehicle and obviously the vehicle is locked okay so hopefully that hasn't confused you too much mate um but yeah that's the laws for up here i don't know the laws from being away from your secure storage facilities um you know down in victoria but um yeah that's what it is up here next question i got here is from john he says uh g'day aussie uh, i gave you southern fried rabbit recipe a go and love it well that's great to hear uh please keep them coming do you have any plans to do more and if so what other meats uh, will you use well mate i want to do a bit with uh, seafood you know some um because i mean that applies to a lot of people out there who you know may not even be into shooting naturally who'd love to get away and do fishing and stuff like that so uh, that'd be good and i also want to do some stuff with roux now uh, roux is a little bit sort of difficult here in queensland because you do need permits and stuff but Honestly, I'm, I'm quite happy just to go down the supermarket and buy some roux meat um, and then, you know, show you a couple of recipes from there. So, yeah, keep an eye out, mate. I'm definitely going to do some more. Okay, so the next question I got here is from Dave and he says, uh, G'day, Aussie. What's your thoughts on new cartridges like 6.5 Creedmoor, 224 Valkyrie and 350 Legend? Um, do you think they're here to stay or are they just a passing phase? Well, I think um, depending on you know the caliber, I think some of them are very much here to stay. 6.5 Creedmoor is a perfect example of that. It's really concreted itself into that long-range target shooting world, and for good reason, mate, because it's got you know a very high BC. It stays supersonic um, for a greater distance over that of 308. So therefore, I think it is a much better long-range uh, caliber over 308 so i think yeah definitely there to stay in that setting but then flip over the other side of the coin when you're looking at hunting i think it's a complete different story for me personally um i probably wouldn't go 6.5 creed more uh, for hunting unless of course you're a little bit recoil sensitive um, and you just really enjoy the caliber you know in general over that of 308 so um, hunting distances, as I've said numerous times, for me, 75 yards to about 125 yards. Yep, sometimes you'll shoot a bit longer than that, but in general, that's my hunting distances. So, um, you know, compare 6.5 Creedmoor to 308, those distances, it just doesn't matter. I don't care even if it's 200 or 300 yards, dead is dead. So it's not as if, um, you know, game animals have suddenly armoured themselves in the last you know, 100 years that requires all these new great calibers, you know, to be able to take them down. Um, it's certainly not the case. So, you know, for me in a hunting setting, a lot of the traditional calibers are just fantastic. So in other words, you know, 22, um, you know, 223, 308, you know, obviously 12 gauge. Um, but then when you go into more niche markets, like, you know, long range um, target shooting, you know, calibers like 6.5 are definitely, you know, an advantage. So yeah, so some of the other calibers you got here, like the 224 Valkyrie, well look, I haven't even seen it in Australia yet. So um, once it hits here, I'd be keen to have a look at one. But um, yeah, I think that's gonna be a very, very niche market because I think most people for long range shooting are going to 6.5 Creedmoor. I just don't know about a um, 22 caliber long range cartridge, um, you know, being that popular here in Australia. We'll, we'll see anyway. Um, 
350 Legend, look, I haven't used that, so I'm not too sure with that as well. But um, yeah, there's numerous old school calibers there that do the job um, quite well in my view anyway. So yeah, some I think will pass, mate. Others like the 6.5 Creedmoor, I definitely think are concreted and here to stay. Next question I got here is from uh, James and he says, G'day Aussie, thanks very much for the last Australian shooter video. It has really inspired me to do more. But I don't know where to start. Can you help me with some tips and speaking with politicians and any other valuable information I could use? Well, look, the best advice I can give you, mate, is, you know, obviously, um, you know, be prepared as in go in there with a purpose and um, be prepared to be, you know, asked questions because you're going to debate different topics. So, you know, for example, like, you know, you can go in there with a very simple purpose of explaining to them that yourself, your family and other family members will not vote for them if they support any more gun restrictions on licensed law-abiding shooters. It's as simple as that. And a lot of people will just go uh, into a uh, meeting with a politician to simply get that message across. So, you know, as I've said many times before, you know, there's no need to be angry, go off, swear, nothing like that. Um, you know, these people are humans as well. Let's not forget that. So they've got families, etc., etc. So you just need to go in, articulate yourself clearly, and, uh, you know, explain your position there. Whether they agree with it or not, look, that's entirely up to them, but at least you've made your point very clear. Um, as for other information, look, you might want to do something a little bit more specific, like talk about the uh, suppressor issue here in Queensland. And you could uh, go in, meet with them and say, well, look, um, there's this petition currently being uh, sponsored, um, you know, by a member of parliament. Are you going to support that or are you going to uh, not support it? If so, why? You know, you want to know why. Um, and then explain the situation from there. You can explain, you know, your understanding of suppressors and how they're not like Hollywood movies, etc., etc. Um, you know, and get your point across from there. So it depends on what topic in particular under the whole, you know, heading of uh, firearms and firearm laws that you want to get across. Um, you've just got to choose that topic and be very clear. Uh, don't really waffle on too much. Um, you know, just be very specific, like because people who don't understand a uh, particular subject or have very limited knowledge of it um, you know if you start going into really really great detail you'll probably lose them so you know keep it to a couple of key points that really make sense to any person that doesn't understand a thing about firearms that that would be my advice with it all right guys so that's it for uh, february q a i hope you enjoyed listening to it uh, thanks very much to those of you who submitted your questions as I say, guys, I am getting a lot of questions from people just in general, and I can understand that. I fully get it. But unfortunately, guys, I limit my responses to you guys who help me out via Patreon or via PayPal. I have to do that. Otherwise, I just will get absolutely nothing done. So, guys, um, please think about that before you're submitting questions. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to help everyone completely free, but... I just can't do it. It is impossible for me to do it because I am fairly time poor. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed uh, watching the Q&A. So till next time, we'll catch you then.